Welcome back to a truly historic episode of the Trogley's Guitar Show. I've brought you guys many rare guitars over the years, from the Steve Howe, the Les Paul, the Super Standard and Custom, the first prehistoric reissue, all the way to things like the Headless SG and the Gibson Jimi Hendrix Strat. But all of those guitars combined pale in comparison to what this is. This is the very last Les Paul Custom to ever be made at the Kalamazoo factory before shutting down. Now sadly, this video will not get as many views as those other guitars, because you have to be a true historian and history buff in the Gibson brand to fully understand just why this guitar is just so special. So to help you guys understand, let's do a little bit of history here. Gibson was first started by a guy named Orville H. Gibson. If you've ever heard of the Japanese brand of Gibsons called Orville's, well now you know why they're called that. But the earliest known instrument that Orville made was done in 1894 and it was a 10 string mandolin. Give him eight more years, in 1902, he opens Gibson in the Kalamazoo, Michigan plant. It operated for 82 years under different ownerships, all the way until 1984 when it was closed down. So any Gibson instrument from 1902 till about 1975 were made in the Kalamazoo plant. Around 75 is when the second plant, Nashville, opened up. So that means all of the legendary bursts, the original gold tops, the L5s, and all the other high-end arch tops, they were all birthed in this factory. There are tons of people who will only buy the old Kalamazoo-made guitars because of the heritage and the history behind all of it. There really is quite a romanticism behind original Kalamazoo plant-made instruments. They just channel all the energy of the golden era of Gibson. So this plant closing in 1984 is a huge deal. And this was the last Les Paul. Custom, anyways. So how the heck do I even know this is the last Les Paul custom? Well, there's a few things. First, we have a special serial number back here that reads the date it was made, 6-15-1984. We'll go a little bit more into that later. But the next big telltale factor is in this beautifully aged vintage Gibson envelope. It is addressed to a Wesley Betty or Beatty, something like that. And on the inside here sleeps Pretty much the earliest known certificate of authenticity. <laughs> That's not exactly what it is, but it tells you right there, July 5th, 1984, which corresponds with the serial number. And it reads, Dear Wes, this letter is to certify that this Les Paul Custom serial number 81674002 is the last Les Paul Custom guitar made in the Kalamazoo plant. Another quality product from Norlin. Well, Norlin didn't have much longer after this point. But if you feel bad for such an iconic factory just going to waste, that's where heritage guitars are now made today. But can you think of just all the thoughts and feelings going through the workers' heads? This was going to be the last Les Paul custom they produce. Do you think they were going to do something super special for it? You can bet your butt they were. There are many non-traditional features on this guitar. Some of them that I was not even expecting. Most of these I'll show you once I throw it on the workbench, but I think you've been noticing it here. Look at this top carve. Gibsons from this time period do not have this. It's referred to as a dish. Essentially what goes on here is they hand carve it so it goes down and then it goes up and makes a belly on the instrument. It really pops them out and that's the way they did them on the 50s. For comparison's sake, here's a 1984 Les Paul Custom. See how it has a little bit of a belly, but, but it's mainly flat. It's not quite as pronounced. Switch back to this puppy and now you see it, right? Oh my goodness. 
see yep. it. Yep. That, that is beautiful. You do not see dish cars on Norland era guitars. And the next super special thing here, I've talked about this a lot with the prehistorics, but this actually has an ABR1 bridge. Now, you might look at it and be like, hey, why is it upside down? And why is there a stud in the body? That's not a stud. What has happened is somebody's doubled up the thumb wheels to prevent post lean. That might be factory but I can't really prove it one way or the other. And another cool feature here is the middle pickup. Yes, three pickup Les Paul Customs do exist in this era, but you mainly find them from like 1975-ish to about 1979, and there's only like around 100 or so per year. So when I saw this one, 1984, that's pretty late. You normally don't see them unless they're custom orders. So that is another beautiful feature. But everything else, we need to tear this guitar apart to look at all of the features. So let's go ahead and do that now. All right, the first thing here is we've got triple Tim Shaw PAFs. The middle one has a very easily to read date stamp of 1983. The neck one is there, but you can't really see it too much. And kind of the same story with the bridge pickup here. So three very coveted pickups. And yes, this middle route is completely original. But one of my biggest questions for this guitar is I was curious, do you think for the very last custom, they gave it a long neck tenon like in the 50s and early 60s? I didn't think they would, but here's your answer. Nope, they didn't, but I did find something else very cool. See that? Made in USA stamp. The only other guitar I've seen that on is the Mark Knopfler run of prehistoric reissues right before that first main run. But that was kind of like a shortly lived trait because since they didn't want to put it on the back of the headstock for trying to be historically specced, they just put it in the neck pickup cavity. So I thought that was fantastic. And then the bridge pickup cavity held a secret too. Now remember that letter I showed you, it had a specific serial number on it but that is not on the back of the headstock. And then I thought maybe, oh, it's gonna be on the inner rim of the control plate, like sometimes they did on some of the other prehistorics. But no, this is the first one I've seen where they stamped it in the bridge pickup cavity. Now it's kind of funny here, as you can see it, it was stamped twice. You've got it right there, but then their stamper machine must have cracked the wood right there. So they're like, oh, well, maybe we should restamp it over here where there's not a hollowed out cavity by it. And there was one more feature I was hoping to see, but unfortunately they fell short. The original 50s PAF Les Paul Customs, they have mahogany tops. And I was curious if we were going to see that, but if you get it in the light just right, you can see it does have a maple top. As far as the pickup readings go, neck pickup in the circuit reads about 7.2. Middle position is a 3.72, which will be these two pickups. And then the bridge pickup itself is 7.3. So it doesn't look like we have like a, a blend knob or anything, which I am perfectly happy without having. Because I personally love the three-way selector switch with three pickups because that middle position, it gives you this really weird single coil-like sound. I love it. Here's a closer look at the ABR1 studs here. As I was talking about earlier, somebody just doubled up the thumb wheels. I have no way to know if they did that at the factory or not, but I went ahead and removed those to prove that yes, it is a traditional ABR1 drilled directly into the top. There are no studs. So I'm gonna leave those be and put those bottom ones on there cause you'd have to live with these impressions around it anyways. And taking a look at the original pieces here, you have a wired ABR1 bridge here, and it says Gibson patent number 2740313. So this is definitely an era correct part. And the tailpiece is full weight, gold plated, and has the tooling mark that it should. We have black bonnet reflector knobs on here that read volume, volume, tone, and tone. This is more so styled after a 1960 Black Beauty custom. Uh, something to know about this one is there might be a small chip repaired out of this knob. And I don't know about you guys, but I think this looks great even without a pick guard on, and I'm usually a pick guard on type of guy. But it was really dusty under here. You could see like the dust imprint of the nut that's on the back of the bracket. So I went ahead and cleaned all that off. So this thing has a brand new fresh start. 
But here you can see the original pickguard still has the protective film on it from the factory. I advise never taking this off because even if you just hate the way that this looks or you just want it to display cleaner and not look new old stock, this pickguard is ruined. If you take this off, the black plastic will forever have this like residue to it that's permanently on it. And underneath here, it's going to age differently because the sticker protected it from sunlight. I had a super custom and I sold it to somebody and then they ended up selling it back and they removed that plate. So I'll show you some photos there. And that's just a forever reminder of that. But here's what the back of the pick guard looks like as well. I don't polish and clean every guitar that I get, but this one actually had some pretty deep scratches and impressions on it that I was curious to see if I could get to disappear. And thankfully, I'm going to say I was successful for the most part. I mean, you've got some light nicks and dings and polishing swirls. If you get it in the light just right, you can still kind of make those ones out that were right here. And unfortunately, what looks like a case ding mark is still there, but... Virtuoso stuff. I'll leave a link in the description. I mean, I'm not paid to sponsor these guys, but there's a reason why if you ever ask what polish should I use, everybody says this stuff because it was formulated specifically for vintage guitars with nitro finishes. So we've got the maple top, which is not correct again, with a mahogany body. I really wish I had an x-ray to see if they weight relieved this because this was right at the start of that. My guess is they probably spared it of that. But you do have the cool Posilock diamond-shaped strap buttons, which was a shortly-lived part from this era of Gibson. The fretboard is beautiful ebony with your low and wide frets, so not fretless wonder since they're wide. Now, what's kind of interesting here is they kind of botched the 12th fret inlay and the 5th fret inlay. You can see like there is some light chipping in the wood around there. I don't know, maybe these inlays fell out and they had to get re-glued at some point in time. But the craftsmanship, despite coming from Kalamazoo and being the last one that they were going to make, yeah, they, they made a few mistakes here. But I absolutely love this ninth fret inlay. You've got like four fingers here and depending on your angling, it looks more blue. That's just an awesome inlay. So besides that, I mean, you just have very minor fret wear, if any at all. The nut width is 1.69 inches, which increases to 2.04 at the 12th. First fret neck depth is 0.8 inches, which then really beefs up at the 12th for a full one inch. And no, they didn't go rogue the last one. They kept it the 24 and 3 quarters inch scale length. The truss rod cover just reads Les Paul Custom. Nothing too crazy going on here. But with that removed, you can see it has a traditional mahogany neck, which had just returned about a year and a half before this guitar is being made, around mid-1982. Truss rod looks great in this one. You can kind of see that maple strip that they used to cover the truss rod channel right there. And we have our Gibson Mother of Pearl logo and custom block inlays. But what I really like is if you zoom in here, you can see there's like black streaks in it. I think that looks awesome. And hey, if that's not cool enough, this guy has the flip out speed winding tuners as well. So that's another 80s part that was shortly lived that just makes this guitar awesome. Okay, so this was a real labor of love on the back. Now it looks like this. It's too shiny. It reflects my ceiling and everything too well. So with the back plates removed, it does still retain the ashtray. This kind of starts phasing out by now. It's, this is actually a pretty late ashtray version. I'm probably just trying to use them up. And then that's what your back plates are looking like. But in here, it's just kind of your standard wiring. You have three 1984 dated pots. And then this one's like a really late 1983. But you've got your two pickups here. Where's your third pickup? Well, it's over here with the selector switch. Then as I was talking earlier, the serial number in the rim, it would normally be like right here. So I was surprised to see it not be there and be in the bridge pickup cavity. But we just have a beautiful mahogany back here. Now the neck, it looks like maybe a strap was on it or maybe that's an impression from the case. You also got some nicks and dings on the back of the neck here, but it is one piece mahogany with two wings on the top. But here's where this guitar just gets really cool. Okay, so it doesn't have a traditional serial number. So 615-1984. So 
that's June 15th. That's the day this thing was either stamped on the neck as usual, or maybe it's even the completion date. And if you translate this date out to a serial number, it's exactly what it should be. The only thing this number doesn't tell you is production. So that's why I was thankful we did find a traditional serial number. But look at this guy. I've been wanting one of these for a long time. Something that says Custom Shop Original. Now you might say, hey, isn't that what the Spotlight Specials have? No, those are Custom Shop Editions. Edition just simply meant it was a limited edition run of some sort, but original meant it was a one-off. It would have special features. I did a rock or not of a really weird one-off SG Custom. So if you have a custom shop original, you have a piece of history. Furthermore, looking at the wind out tuners here, what makes these extra special is I guess, apparently from the factory, originally these all probably had these little protective plastic coatings on them. And it's just like a rubber gel sticker. These still have them on there. They were kind of dirty, but I cleaned them up so we could see through them a little bit better but that is just kind of another little cool nitpicky feature that this thing has. This example weighs 10 pounds, 4.2 ounces. Now that we know just how special this instrument is, let's go ahead and hear how it sounds. <laughs> we know how this instrument sounds, let's go ahead and review its condition. I would love to be able to tell you this thing is in absolute mint condition, the way it looks, but no, it's just because I polished it up real good. I spent a good three hours on this guy. So as far as the headstock goes, you do have a little bit of cracking around the lacquer where these tuners are. You can kind of see what I'm talking about right here. And there's also a small discoloration spot on the Gibson headstock right here. It's really hard to notice, but it is there. 
but there's no deep gouges or anything. Your truss rod still functions just fine. Your nut is set up real nice. Your frets were just polished up. The ebony fretboard was conditioned. You are good to go here with a fresh set of 10 gauge Diodario strings. And we've got polishing swirls pretty much all over this instrument. You've got some nicks and dings and light imperfections into the finish. But what I was really happy about here is there were some really deep scratches and nicks and dings in this thing when I got it. So I don't use abrasive polishes. I just use the Virtuoso stuff as I told you earlier. And I was very pleased with how this turned out. So there are some deeper scratches in this area, but you really can't tell them anymore. And then right here is kind of where that case must have came down on it at one point in time and the latch got it. But besides polishing swirls on the front and those nicks and dings we were just talking about, this thing's in phenomenal shape. Original thing on the pick guard. The gold, it's got some scratches and light wear, but it presents phenomenally for being as old as it is. And again, the ABR-1's backwards from the factory. I was going to set it up properly, but then I saw, hmm, well, the saddles are kind of specific to the way it was, so I just let it be. Back of the headstock, special edition serial number is 61584. Again, custom shop original decal. Gibson flip-out winding tuners. And the back of the neck here, it's in good shape. But as you get up here, you can see it's either from the case, it resting in the case for so long, it's got some like impressions here, or maybe there was a strap in the case for a long period of time. And you've got a few light nicks and dings on the back of the neck. The backside of the instrument was also well taken care of, polished it up good for you. But you do have some light marks here and there. But, I mean, this is a collector's guitar anyways. I don't think people care about what condition this thing is really in. It's more so the history behind this one. The sides of the instrument, I'll be honest, I got lazy. <laughs> I did not polish the sides, so you can see some residue from somebody's poor polish job in the past. But it, it doesn't look anywhere near as bad as the front and back did when I got it. But beautiful posi lock diamond strap buttons. This thing is... It's just such a joy, guys. So let's go ahead and pop it under black light here. Nothing too major going on here. You can see some light lacquer wear areas on the top, like right there. And there's like a small dot right there. But everything's glowing the way I would want to see. Even the knobs are looking great. Looking around the edges, I mean, this is pretty much a no excuses example. They're looking good. Back of the instrument, same thing kind of going on here. It looks like it might have been on a stand for a while, or it's just been rubbing in the case. That's why some of the clear coat is worn. It almost looks like you can see through to the wood grain. And I kind of noticed that in the photos as well. So they might have done like a super thin finish on this as another special feature. Back of the neck, also glowing the way I'd want to see. You can tell it hasn't been played very much. And then the back of the headstock here all looking good now as far as why over the serial number looks a little bit different i would hypothesize that they probably waited to stamp that into the wood until it had been completed so they have the official date on it and then they just kind of resprayed over it that would be my guess it could also just be lacquer wear from rubbing against the back of the case as sometimes those headstocks will touch but no breaks, cracks, or repairs, and that's mainly what we're looking for here. This instrument retains an era-correct Gibson hard shell case. I'm guessing it's the original one, but with all cases, you can't really prove it. But a lot of people are always confused about these. They think they went away in like the late 70s when the chainsaw case came out. That's totally false. These cases ran alongside the chainsaws all the way into the 80s. But... Obviously, some features change from like 70s versions. The later made versions like these, I actually find they're more protective. They kind of have more of an arch top to them, and the quality of wood just seems to be better on these guys. But we have three latches on the front with a locking one, and then this one has another one on the back. So four in total with a functioning handle. 
as far as condition goes, we've got scuffs, we've got some tears to the Tolex. I mean, the case is in worse shape than the guitar, but, but I mean, hey, this thing's not trashed either. And the interior is just nice and red. I mean, it's definitely housed the guitar for a long time. It's still pretty plush. I mean, these things were never great to begin with. I personally prefer the chainsaw case. But in here sleeps the original case key. Got a single neck rest. Yeah, nothing too much to say about this one. If you think you might be interested in being the next owner of the last Les Paul custom made in Kalamazoo, hey, you're going to have to throw a bunch of money at me because this thing, oh man, I, I don't want to give this one up. <laughs> All right, thank you troglodytes for tuning into this historic episode of the Troglies Guitar Show. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Hey, share this video with a friend who might enjoy it. And we will see you tomorrow on the next episode. Take care.